Good evening, welcome. Thank you for joining me. My name is Cynthia Stewart. I am a senior mortgage loan advisor at Ideal Credit Union. Thank you so much for your interest and for joining me. Uh, we are gonna be talking about home buying in the current marketplace. And um, you know, mortgage trends do tend to move. Um, the marketplace never stays the same. So it's constantly moving. A couple of years ago was the big refinance boom, the rates were low, um, and now it's kind of shifted again. Um, this is the agenda that we're gonna go over this evening. Uh, current market update, um, going over what a mortgage review looks like, the difference between being pre-approved or pre-qualified, um, how much do you qualify for, um, tips in today's market, why you should use a realtor, and making an offer um, and then once your offer is accepted, and then moving towards a closing. So interest rates have been moving up and they have been going up and they've been going down. They're sitting currently right around 7%, give or 7.125% uh, 7 .2, today on a conventional FHA was at 7%. And they do constantly move. So mortgage rates aren't tied to any one thing. Um, some people watch the 10-year treasury. Um, sometimes they think that when the feds meet that that directly affects mortgages. Everything affects the mortgage rates. Everything that's going on in the economy and in the world, um, some things will spike it up and then it will come back down. Uh, sometimes it stays up or down a little bit longer. But when we look at rates, we look at the current rate at the time that we can lock you in, we price it. So we post a rate and that's only what that is. That's a posted rate. That's the rate that we go out and we determine based on certain criteria, this is the rate that we can post at. Then it depends on if it's a purchase is it a refinance? What is your credit? The type of home, et cetera, will all make a difference in the rate that you qualify for. Um, house prices um, and demand have remained strong. So some houses are coming down a little bit, you know, in their pricing. Others are staying steady. I don't feel there's going to be a huge drop. I know some people are waiting to buy thinking house prices are going to drop. I don't know if we're going to have that happen. I think they'll just kind of stabilize, stay the same. Um, and, you know, a, lend, a realtor will move down a price if it sits on the market for a certain length of time. But that's also up to the seller is if they're comfortable uh, moving that house price down. They're kind of in control of what do they set the price at? When are they comfortable moving a price down? Um, so that's up to them. Um, buyer demand continues to increase, although this week I've seen that our applications have dropped off a little bit. So that's the thing with the market is that it's constantly um, changing. Um, we kind of just talked about that. Will increasing mortgage rates cause home prices um, to fall? You know, that's a great question. I don't think that that's gonna have anything to do with the house prices. Um, just like any other commodity, it has to do with supply and demand. Um, houses have had a nice increase over time. Um, my thought is, is that they're just going to maybe kind of stay the same and maybe we won't have as significant of increases versus like, you know, like a, a big drop um, in, the, in the prices. There we go. Um, how many offers will you be going up against a bidding war? Um, I haven't seen as much of the bidding wars, although on occasion there is one of those houses um, that is just one that for whatever reason seems to be a little bit more, and maybe it's in that specific, a certain neighborhood or price point um, that gets that spurs up where you can have multiple offers, uh, aka a bidding war. Um, and when a uh, offer chain when they when the realtor decides that we're in multiples, there only has to be two offers. Then you're in multiples. And a bidding war is typically sometimes they will strategically price a house low. Like let's say the whole house was worth three fifty, and they're going to price it at two hundred and ninety nine. That's going to pique some interest, and then you might get what's called a bidding war because several people or will get more people interested in the home, and then. Uh, sometimes there'll be that little bit of a bidding for um, shop for homes price below what you can afford. Um, that's a good idea to shop for. Um, so right now with the rates going up, 
and the current market we're in, if I thought your max purchase price was, let's say, 350000 I would suggest that you probably start shopping around 300 so that if rates would go up, you would still then uh, be able to afford, or, you know, then if you find something at 325, if you start at the max that you're pre-approved for, uh, then if the rates go up, uh, you may now not be able to afford that home. And there's several factors that go into what you can afford. It's the price of the house, the current, you know, interest rates, but then there's also mortgage insurance typically, and also, um, the property taxes, and if it's a townhome or condo that has association dues, and single family standalone homes, some neighborhoods have association dues, but those tend to be a little bit smaller monthly amounts. So, really, it's like looking at the townhouses or condos. You know, um, I hate to say, but my HOA is 475. Um, some are 250, 225. So, that can make a big difference in what you can afford when you look at some of the other. Um, things that go into that payment. Um, when you are making offers on the home, there are different types of offers you could be going up against. Um, that could be um, the townhouse I sold three years ago, I did have a cash offer. Um, appraisal gap coverage, we haven't seen that as much in the current market that we're in, but what that means is that if you make an offer on a house that let's say is 300,000, and um, you could uh, tell the seller if it doesn't appraise at 300,000, you're willing to cover the gap out of your own money. So let's just say it appraised at 290,000, you would have to make up that $10,000 from the amount that it was appraised for um, versus what you agreed to buy it for. So the seller is still selling then at 300,000. So you're saying that you will guarantee up to a certain dollar amount and you can, you can set which of that gap coverage would be. So as an example, if you set it at 10,000, that would mean if the house appraised at 290, you would pay the difference to the seller out of your own pocket. Now, let's say it appraised at 285, then you could make up the 10,000 and the seller would drop the price the 5,000 to take care of the total 15,000 gap. So that's what a gap coverage. Um, in some offers, some people may waive the uh, inspection contingency. I haven't been seeing that happen anymore. All of the deals I've been getting lately, they are not waiving the inspection, but if you feel strongly, maybe you're knowledgeable in construction or uh, have someone that maybe went with you on the showing that is, and you feel strongly that you're not concerned about an inspection, you could certainly waive that to help your offer be the one um, that is um, accepted. The down payment amount that you put on the pre-approval letter, um, if you can say you have, say, 20% down versus 5% or 10% versus you know, 3%, it could make your offer look stronger in the fact that you have more assets and you're willing to put more down out of your own pocket. Um, earnest money, you do pay the earnest money um, up front. Um, so that is given to the seller at the time that you make the offer. Now we're gonna look at um, some of the interest rates kind of over the last, since 2022. So as you can see, they have gone up considerably. I think the lowest for a 30-year mortgage was right around 3%. It might've dipped a little bit, but I think it was right around the three. And as of today, we're posted at the 7.125%. So sadly, what that also means is it's really affecting people's affordability for a home. So the next slide is gonna talk about that. So here we're looking at, you know, back in 2022, if you were looking at a $300,000, you know, purchase price, you're putting down 15,000 um, based on an interest rate at 5.34%, your payment on that home would be about 21.3471. To get a payment roughly around the same in the current market, you would need to drop your price to about 245%. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm really running into right now is that um, for some people, sadly, it's totally taking them out of the market. 
the interest rates have gone up, the price of houses have gone up, and it's really just not affordable in their debt to income ratio. And debt to income ratio is one of the things that we use to gauge how much of a home you can afford. It takes into consideration your current debts, the um, mortgage payment on your current house versus your income. So you need to be within certain guidelines. So unfortunately for a lot of people, um, they no longer can afford the house that they they wanted to afford maybe in that 300. So if you had been pre-approved with me in 2022 and we were looking at 300, we've moved that down now to about 245. Or if you can afford the larger you know, payment on a house um, to the bigger payment, um, then you know, you're gonna have less residual income to live off of, meaning less money that's left over at the end of the month. Um, so you might still be able to afford the house, but it dips into your funds a little bit more. So um, one thing we do offer here at the credit union is a free mortgage consultation. What that means is you can come and speak with myself and we have another loan uh, mortgage loan advisor, Jennifer, our manager, Cow, also um, assists with that at times. And we can sit down with you. We can do what's called a soft pull on your credit. What a soft pull versus a hard pull means is that the soft pull does not register as an inquiry, um, but it does give us a look at two of the three major credit reports. It gives us a really good idea of where your credit scores are, what debts are reporting, um, and then we can look at like your income and things like that, which will help us understand and help figure out for you maybe what the best loan product is and um, maybe where we think your affordability will be to help you kind of come up with and understand the different uh, loan options. Um, and one thing we call with the mortgage consultant is we can do what's called a pre-qualification versus a pre-approval. So let's talk about pre-qualification first. Um, it's an estimate of your ability to borrow money. We can do the soft pull on your credit, review your income, and we don't even necessarily have to have a pay stub. You could just tell me I make X number of dollars an hour, or if your commission or whatever your income is, we can, we can work on helping determine what we think that income is. Um, and then based on what you tell us, we can come up with, okay, I think this might be the best type of mortgage for you. Um, this is where we think the max that you could get approved for. And keep in mind, if I tell you you could go up to 300,000 or 600,000, 200,000, whatever that number is, you need to make sure it fits into your budget. So that doesn't mean you want to go up to the max. So, but we can look at um, how much funds are you going to need? Where do we think that max or that you know loan amount should be? How much funds are you going to um, need? And a lot of people will do this, you know, a year, I've even had people come to me a couple of years before they're going to be ready to buy so that they have time to get their credit, the funds that they need, and to have a really good understanding of how that they can move forward. So a prequal, we're not doing the hard hit on your credit. Um, you can give us some income docs, or we can just go over by what you tell us, and we can kind of go through that process. We'll need to know also what other debts or liabilities you have, such as a car payment, um, those type of things. If we're actually doing the soft pull on the credit, we should have a pretty good idea of that from the credit report. If we do a pre-approval, this is what you want before you meet with the realtor and before you go looking for houses. Because chances are, if you're looking for houses before you're pre-approved, you're gonna find the house that you want to buy and have to have, but you don't have a pre-approval letter. And that's what the other realtor, the listing agent, the sellers wanna see is a pre-approval letter. This says that you have met with someone in the loan area. They have pulled a hard pull on your credit. They have verified your income. They have verified the funds that you have um, to buy a home and the letter is telling them this person is able to shop for and buy and get a mortgage for the home that they're looking at or that they're making the offer on. So you want to get pre-approved. We're going to do a hard pull on your credit. We're going to do a full application. We're also going to collect other documents and that will depend on um, what type of loan and how you qualify. So for instance, if you're self-employed, we would get your two most recent federal um, 
bank state or um, tax returns and review your tax returns and all of the schedules that go with it. If you're a W-2 employee, we're gonna get W-2s, we're gonna get your pay stubs. So once we have you in the system um, or we talk before you come in, we can let you know what documents based on your income we're gonna need. If you're collecting child support, we're gonna need the court order or the document that states what that amount is that you are out uh, that you receive. And then we're going to need proof you receiving it for the next that you've received it for the last six months to show that it is coming in. So all every type of income has a little bit different documentation that we need. So once we get your application in, or we've talked to you ahead of time, uh, we can um, definitely um, tell you and communicate what to bring in uh, so that we can do the pre approval process. Uh, once you're pre approved, we communicate that to you and to your realtor and go over all the details. And then we would want to stay in touch with you and have you stay in touch with us during the process of shopping with the home. So we get you ready to go. Then you go and work with a realtor. And then, you know, you can come back to us during that process. Hey, I found a house. What's the payment? Where are the rates? Things like that. We can issue. Uh, pre-approval letter specific for that house. So usually the first letter that we give you has the amount that you're pre-approved up to. So let's say 300,000. Now you've gone and looked at a home. Now, instead of giving the seller the letter that says the 300,000, we're gonna issue you a new letter that says property address with just the address of the home with no amount on it. So that tells the listing agent and the seller, I looked up that house, I saw the purchase price, I look to make sure that you could afford it, and I'm telling them that you can afford the house by issuing that letter uh, with the um, address on it. These are some of the commonly asked questions that I get when I meet with people. How do I determine if I uh, you know, qualify to buy? How much of a mortgage can I afford? How much money do I need? What will my payments be? And those are all questions that we can answer either during the pre-qualification, um, the pre-qual, or when we do the pre-approval. Um, without knowing your credit score, your income, uh, what type of loan that you're gonna do, those are all things that will help us determine um, how much you qualify for, how much cash do you need, um, should I wait or should I buy now? Those type of things. And some of the basics with a mortgage, um, you need a 620 credit score for an FHA or a conventional mortgage. A VA loan, a VA loan is 600. So the ones that I just stated are some of the common mortgage products. FHA and VA are government products. That just means they're backed by the federal government. And then a conventional loan if you would need the mortgage insurance, which is an insurance product um, that you take out on the loan um, that protects the loan in case you default, um, that loan is a conventional loan and that is not done through the government. So there's different types. And then once we sit down with you, we'll know better which loan that you qualify for. And each one has just a little bit different qualification. So for instance, a VA loan, you don't have to put any money down. An FHA loan is three and a half percent down. A conventional loan is minimum 3% if you're a first time home buyer. Otherwise, it's 5% down on a conventional loan. So each one has a little different parameters, and that's why it's really important to speak to us ahead of time so you have a really good idea before you go out there what you qualify for, you know, what will your payments be, how much money do you need. We can answer all of those questions for you. We did already talk a little bit about most commonly needed items. We need 30 days worth of pay stubs. So if you're a biweekly employee, that's two. Um, if you're also a pay stub employee, you would get W-2s at the end of the year. We need a two-year history. So if I was working with you right now, I would want 2021 and 2022 W-2s for all jobs that you've had, not just your current job if you've switched, but any other positions. That shows the underwriter that you've had um, a consistent job history, and you do need a two-year job history to use the income. So that is also true if you have more than one um, employer. So let's say you do have two jobs, you would have had to have had a second job for two years. 
Now, that doesn't mean it has to be at the same employer. You could have worked at one company for a year and a half, and you've been at the other one for six months. So as long as you have a two-year history uh, for what you'd consider your main job, and then if you had a part-time job, you also need a two-year history there. Again, it doesn't have to be with the same employer, but there cannot be any big gaps in between your employment dates. So when you meet with us, it is important. We need to know the name of your employer, the address, your start date, if it's a previous employer, your end date, and the position that you had when you worked there. Um, if you have any type of retirement or um, social security, um, those type of incomes, any type of income other than that, we just have to verify the income and have something that documents how much you receive. If you receive child support, you have to have received it for six months. If it's like social security, maybe you're just going on social security. As long as you have the award letter that says it's coming, we can use that income. Uh, here at the credit union, if it's a government loan, we always need tax returns. If it's a conventional loan, we typically only need tax returns if you have commission income, Maybe you work for tips, uh, get bonuses and things like that. Sometimes we need them, sometimes we don't. And then the bank statements to show the income. Of course, if you bank here and they're here, we can pull those bank statements um, for you. We've been talking a little bit about the debt to income. The debt to income is taking how much your um, bills are and dividing that by your income. So for instance, if you make, um, uh, $10,000 a month, your debt to income, we typically can go up to 45%. So if you made $10,000 a month, 45% of that is 4,500. This means that's the amount total you can have in debt a month. So that would be car payments, student loans, spousal maintenance, child support, credit card, auto loans, boat loans, any debts that you have, including your new house payment could not be more than 4,500. Now, in some cases, if you have substantial assets or you've put a substantial amount down, we can sometimes go over 45%, but that's kind of the guideline that we use. Um, in some cases, we can get in approvals up to 48 to 49, but I would want you to be careful in the fact that you wanna make sure that this is an affordable payment for you going forward because so you can be a successful homeowner and still live life, right? Because when I get you approved and we're telling you what you can be approved for, we're not looking at the cost of your car insurance, medical things, you know, your lifestyle. Um, so you wanna make sure that, you know, we don't look at, um, we don't typically look at, now VA does look at your cost of childcare and some of those things, and that's because they don't charge the mortgage insurance and it's zero down. But for like FHA and conventional mortgages, they don't get into uh, some of the other expenses that you have on your house. So we wanna make sure that you can afford that payment. So it doesn't always mean you should go up to 45%. Healthy household is usually 36 to 40% of your income is really good. And I would say if there's more than one of you, if you can live off the lowest income, that sets you up really good for the future as well. Varying factors that affect how much you might qualify for. We have talked a little bit about this, but the purchase price, the amount that you put down, the interest rates, the type of home. So for instance, a condo, um, the interest rate on a condo is usually sometimes up to a quarter percent higher than a townhouse or what we call a standalone detached single family home. Also the other debts that you have can definitely make a difference in what you can qualify for. Student loans have been, um, you know, with COVID, they went into um, deferment, um, but we still had to take into consideration a payment, even if it showed zero, because we knew that someday you would have to start making payments on them again. So those are things that can greatly affect um, the location of the house, which can affect your property taxes. Um, so. Um, for instance, I'm in Woodbury right now. It has three different school districts. Um, the school districts um, come after funds on your property taxes, so that can make a difference. 
Typically, um, homes proper in, say, the city of St. Paul have higher taxes, and I believe that's kind of based on the fact that those neighborhoods are a little bit older, and so some of the systems probably cost more to maintain than in some of the newer housing areas. So there can be different pockets in certain areas that will have higher taxes than other because of school districts um, locations. Um, that can also affect your homeowner's insurance or an HO6 policy. An HO6 policy is the type of homeowner's insurance when someone has a, um, a condo or a townhome, and that's because the association covers a master policy that rebuilds the home, and you're kind of only covering the things if you could pick it up and shake your house, what falls out, where... Um, uh, with a homeowner's policy, you're covering everything, the actual home itself. If it's a single family detached home, you're covering not only rebuilding the home, but all of the things you could shake out. So with a HOA, you're still paying the insurance for the building, but it's collected in your homeowner's association dues. So it's not covered in the policy um, that you have to take out your lifestyle and your plan for future changes. So those are things that I don't get into, but you would. So for instance, um, are you gonna have children? Maybe you already have children. As children get older, they get more expensive typically. Um, pets, traveling, you know, what? what is your lifestyle? Do you go out a lot with friends and things? Do you go to the movies? Are you a bird watcher? Maybe you travel every year. There's a trip you take. You know, you want to make sure lifestyle can definitely uh, make a factor. So tips for the current marketplace that we have, you definitely want to get pre-approved. That's going to make a big difference and do that before you're shopping for a house. It always breaks my heart a little bit when I meet with someone and they're super excited. I had a couple come in. They've been looking for houses. They had a price point in mind and they didn't qualify for that much of a house. It was actually quite a quite a bit lower. Well, the houses in the lower are, would not have compared to the ones with you know, master bedrooms with ensuite bathrooms, and they just weren't in that. So it's really good to get pre-approved to make sure you're looking in your correct um, price point. Um, I really suggest an experienced full-time realtor because they're really keeping up on the market. They're knowledgeable. It's what they do full-time. It's great if you have someone that you know and they're only doing it part-time. Um, the market has shifted a little bit, but especially in the market that we had before where it was like, if you saw a house, you needed to make an offer. Well, if your realtor is not working full time and they're at their full time job all day, you could miss out on homes because they're not readily available. And we kind of mentioned this before, but shop below what you can afford. Make sure you stay within your budget. Then if you need to offer a little bit more than uh, what the house is listed for and um, you know, you want to, if you, you know, if you love the property, you do want to be able to act fast. So definitely get pre-approved. I would use a full-time home buyer and then really shop in your price point. Sometimes I get people pre-approved and they're shopping at the top and then they come back and the numbers are so tight or the rates have moved up and now they don't qualify. And those are things that can make a huge difference. Um, how much money you will need. So I'm going to show you an example of that, but there's three parts to the money. One is the down payment. The down payment is the amount that you put down in the house. So that's not, it's a cost, but it benefits you. If your house costs, you know, 300,000 and you put down 10%, that's 30,000. If you put down 5%, that's 15,000. That means that you're then, if you put down the 10% at 30,000, you're borrowing 270. So that down payment benefits you because it's lowering what you owe on your house. The difference between what you owe on your house and the value is the equity. So if you put down 10%, you have a 10% equity position in the house. Then there's closing costs. Closing costs are the lender, the title company and the government fees. So the lender, if you use Ideal Credit Union, we have to pay for an appraisal, we do a flood search, we need to get paid so they can afford to pay me and our computer systems and everything that it takes to do the mortgage. We pull a credit report. Then you have the title company. The title company performs certain services for you as well. Um, and what they're doing is they're researching that home before you buy it 
to make sure that when it goes into your name, no one else has a claim on that property. They're also the ones that facilitate you signing all of the legal documents to go into the home. Um, they also disperse all of the money where it needs to go, and they take all those legal documents and file them at the county, and the county then charges fees to register that mortgage in your name and to file those documents. So all together, the lender, title, and government, those are the true closing costs charged by the three companies that you need to assist you. Then as the homeowner, at the time that you're doing the loan, there are some expenses that are collected at closing. Um, and we can go into this more when you meet with one of us and kind of the reasons behind it, but we do collect one year of homeowner's insurance in advance. You pay interest to the lender um, from the day of closing to the end of that month. So if you closed on September 30th, you'd pay one day of interest. If you closed today, you'd pay about 16 days of interest. Um, uh, you may not have heard of an escrow account, but when you make your payments to the lender, the lender um, is collecting the principal and interest portion of the payment. That's the parts that paying down the amount that you borrow. We also collect uh, portions to go towards your tax and insurance payments. So we're collecting one twelfth of the annual amounts and we set those aside in what's called an escrow account for you. And then we make those payments on your behalf. Um, then there's some other miscellaneous fees. If it's a townhouse or condo, they usually have us collect um, a couple months of your, um, a month of your association dues. Um, if it's new construction, there's a couple other little extra fees. And all of that put together is, is what you're gonna need to close. And everyone just kind of bundles it all together and says closing costs, but there's really three parts to the money. So here's an example. If you purchased a $300,000 house, with $3,600 a month in um, annual taxes, that breaks down to about $300 a month. Your homeowner's insurance, if it was $1,500 for the annual policy, that breaks down to $125 a month. So you would need a down payment of $9,000. Your closing costs are $6,000. And let's just assume prepaid items were $3,000. You would then need a total at closing of $18,000. So that's how much money you would need to bring to the table. Now, when you make an offer on the house, you're gonna give the seller what's called earnest money. So let's just assume you gave them uh, $3,000 earnest money, 1% of the purchase price. Then at the closing, you would only need to bring in 15,000 because you've already given 3,000 towards your costs. I hope that's all making sense. Um, let's move on to the next item, that is why use a realtor. Um, again, they're knowledgeable of the current market, especially if they're full-time, they're going to have a really good pulse on things. Um, also, another reason to use a full-time realtor is chances are they have made some relationships with other realtors. The company that they work for, they have some really good resources there and other um, realtors that they can say, hey, I have someone looking for a house in this area. Do you have any um, for sale in that area or that may be coming on the market soon? So sometimes they network together to help them um, you know, uh, find a home. They're also working just for you. If you go to a, a showing and you decide to partner with the realtor who's selling that house, they've actually have a, an agreement with the seller to work on their behalf and do the best for them. So they can assist you, but they're really not working just for you on, on your behalf. So it's really a good idea to have your own realtor. Now, one, one thing to know is that your realtor gets paid by the seller. So when you go to sell a home, you meet with the realtor that you want to list your house, you decide on a um, commission. So let's assume that that commission is 6%. Of the 6% commission, your realtor that's selling the house gets 3.3% of that uh, sale price. The realtor for you, the buyer gets 2.7%. And that's decided before you even get there. So having a realtor working just on your behalf is typically not gonna cost you anything because it's being paid by the seller. So that's how that works. So you don't have to worry that you're paying your realtor's um, 
uh, commission fees because that is coming um, from um, the seller. Your realtor will also, you know, negotiate for you. They can also give you an evaluation like comps of the property and help you determine uh, what price you want to offer. Because realistically, that's up to you what you want to offer on the home. You know, you'll have the list price at $300,000. Maybe your realtor looks at the comps and says, you know what? Based on all the comps, I think two hundred ninety dollars would be a good place to start. And then you ultimately make the decision on uh, what price um, you're going to offer. So the next slide talks about that, things to consider, perch price, the comparable homes, um, has there been multiple offers? Because they can look at that area that you're looking in or maybe even look at that realtor. What is that realtor, like how do their houses normally go? Um, they can help you with when there's highest and best offer situation. Um, if you want to do any contingencies and contingencies are things like you want to have an inspection. That means that when you make an offer, if the seller accepts it, it's not, um, you're not moving forward until after the contingency for the inspection has been completed. And once that's been completed, then you're moving on. Um, and then if you have put an inspection contingency, you set up the inspection. And then we had talked about the earnest funds. That means that you're giving the seller side are you giving them some of the money up front, um, basically telling the seller, I'm very interested, I mean, this is, an, this is a, um, a, a solid offer, I'm giving you $3,000 earnest money to hold until we go to closing so that they know that you are a serious buyer. Once you have an accepted offer, so you've made the offer, um, you submit your earnest money, you do your inspections, you set up your home insurance, the lender orders your appraisal and title. We're gonna get your updated documents from you because let's say um, I met with you uh, two months ago, got pay stubs, W-2s, proof of funds. Now you're gonna go to closing. We have to get updated statements, updated pay stubs um, and things like that. So we would go over all of that with you. And then once we have you know everything together and we get um, a clear to close, um, then you can get ready for and move to closing. Um, the title company is going to reach out to you. They're a separate entity from the lender. Um, your realtor is going to know title companies that you use. We can make suggestions and you ultimately, just like you can choose your realtor or your lender, you can choose the title company that you use. Um, again, they're going to do their due diligence up front to make sure that when you go into that home, that that home, that you own it free and clear. Um, they're going to schedule your closing date and time. And um, then you want to make arrangements, you know, with your lender now to get the final details and documents. The lender provides a closing disclosure. And what a closing disclosure is, it's going to be a document that you get at the end that shows you all of the numbers and how much you need to bring in closing. Um, you're also going to get packing and get ready to move, maybe set up the truck or your friends, however, uh, you're going to be moving that day, so you have that. Uh, a couple days before the closing, you are going to do what's called a final walkthrough. That's where you and your realtor set up another showing to walk through the home and make sure that um, the house is in the same condition and um, you're ready to go. Um, if your realtor would find something that's not in the same condition, then you have some time to work that out. Uh, with the seller. It doesn't happen very often, but sometimes on occasion um, in a walkthrough at the end, I did have one home that had a little bit of water in the basement. It didn't end up to be anything serious and they were able to take care of it right away. I think something was leaking. So they made some last minute considerations. I think they needed a new water heater or something. So you do do the walkthrough before you close again to ensure that the property is in that same condition. On closing day, you will need a valid picture ID. And a valid picture ID means it's not expired. It does need to be government issued, such as a passport, military ID, a state issued ID card or driver's license. You're gonna review and sign the documents with your title closer. You will need to provide a cashier's check or wired funds that are due at closing. So you have to bring the funds to them. Um, and each title company has a different way that they want to receive funds. Typically, it's a cashier's check, or they may require a wire. It will sometimes depend on that company 
or it could also depend on the dollar amount. Sometimes they have a limit. They'll accept a cashier's check up to say 75,000 or 100,000. After that, they want the funds um, uh, to be wired. On closing day, you will be in attendance with yourself. Uh, sometimes your realtor goes, sometimes they don't, but typically your realtor will be at the attendance and then the title closer. Uh, years ago, it used to be that it would be you, the sellers, both the realtors and the closer. Um, but after COVID hit, that kind of changed a little bit. Many of the sellers now pre-sign. The person who's selling the house can pre-sign. The buyers um, have to sign on the actual day of closing. Once you've done that, you get your keys and you now are a homeowner and can move into your new home. I really hope that you got some value. If you have any questions, please do email me. Uh, you can find me here by calling our main number. You can also reach out to me directly. Uh, we also have our team. You can make appointments with us online at the top of the webpage. It has a, an uh, appointment link to make an in-branch appointment. I thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, and we hope to hear from you. Bye-bye.